February is always very eventful for the chamber and of course naturally we want to uh, during the learning luncheon we want to take advantage of an opportunity to talk about National Park Fund and so with that um, anyway and so uh, I'm going to turn this over to to my co-host here we'll get started thank you so much for being here program. 
it's trademark. You can't copy it. You know, it's theirs now. But we talk on it to help utilize, you know, what they have offered. And uh, the burden is this: 1.5 million. focus on certain, you know, kind of communities in, you know, which need special attention, because their problems are also different, and we need to be aware of that. So, how have we done? Remember in the 1950s, what was the life expectancy in 1950, 60? Anyone? 30. Today, what is the life expectancy for a woman? Since you're off numbers. <coughs> Very good. A, a woman in America today, the life expectancy is around 65. And men? Not far behind, 77. Not bad. this is a kind of a multi-pronged attack, you know, we keep people healthy, you have to, the community steps up, and we have to find out what is available for the community to come and step it up. We can optimize care based on what we have available, and then we look at priority population, maybe target, you know, our attention to certain populations. So, <coughs> keeping people healthy is the old Low sodium, I'm really happy you guys have a hot healthy diet today, but keep the sodium low. Tobacco is a no-no, there's no compromise. You can have a glass of wine here and there, a little alcohol again. Moderation in alcohol is the key. Sometimes they say you drink like the French, you know, they drink a little every day for the rest of their life. But we work like a dog Monday to Friday and then go big Aspirin, B is blood pressure, C is cholesterol, and stuff in the cigarettes. And it goes out. There's some E and F also. But those are the three main. Cardiac rehab has, was a kind of a forgotten thing. But now, even if you have a small event, you have a stent or an unstable angina, what do we do? We offer him cardiac rehab. And Medicare does reimbursement. 
cancers can be tailor-made to the patient. You know, and something we don't have specific cardiac rehab, but our rehab people, they do it when you give them the guidelines. We have a full-fledged rehab unit in Lucknow. That's above our office, right? And it's open for anyone who's had a cardiac arrest. Heart-healthy behavior. Now, I told you about targeting certain population. How do you do prevention? Not by leaving it at 65. You've got to target who are at risk at this age. 35 to 65. We also target Afro-American because, you know, I've seen there's an anxious father who brings a 15-year-old and says he needs fitness for football. This is a 300-pound linebacker. And I check his blood pressure. It's 178, 510. He's age 15. So it's not 35. There you've got to go much earlier. By the time he's 30, he's had 15 years of blood pressure, which is affecting his kidneys, affecting his heart. Drop their blood pressure at that age, 15, he will thank you for that. A lot of the morning, I used to follow basketball, I play a little, until I put all this weight on and lost my knee. But <clears throat> while he was playing for the Miami Heat, he had a kidney transplant while he was playing in NBA. Why? Because the same problem blood pressure, you know, to disregard. Oh, he had 160, 110. No, it's not normal. Blood pressure is normal, like day of arm. That's normal. And we are aggressively treating that now. Because we have learned it the hard way. So that's how you do it, you know. Anyone who's had a heart attack or a stroke or anything is high risk. And usually it's sort of wakening call, you know. You have one heart attack or an event or a stroke or even a stent, think twice. thing about the A, B, and C's of optimizing therapy, A1C is a great way of looking at diabetes, because you can't cheat, you know, you can't stop and say, hey, my pressure, no, it's not, your A1C is 9, bring it down to the 6 range or 7 at least, you know, blood pressure as low as possible without letting him pass out, so that was a seesaw kind of thing, A1C is not <coughs> said, okay, let's get it down to 5.5, what happens? People are passing out with hypoglycemia and all that. So the American Diabetic Association said, okay, <coughs> let's back off a little bit. Huh? So even if you have something with a six in it, you're okay. That's how you've got to do it. Same thing for blood pressure. I can't get a 70-year-old you know, to say, your blood pressure will be 110 by 80. No, he, he, he stand up and he pass up. So we let a little a leeway for that. 140. Days, the wise old professor with his stethoscope and multi prong. There was no echo, there was nothing in those days. And he would ask them and say, Oh, this blood pressure is. They used to calculate blood pressure with 100 plus your age. So if you're an 85 year old lady, 185 was accepted in those days, 40 years old. So that's okay. And then we did studies and trials, and then we realized how wrong we were. Take blood pressure to the best of your ability. It will save you a stroke in your life. So that's how we do it. Of course, diabetes, exercise, those are food choices. So, how much? If you cut your sodium intake by about even 20%, you know, tobacco use is no compromise. No, you start by decreasing, but it has to go. And unfortunately, we see vaping <coughs> bars and things like that coming up. No, vaping is a bad idea. Kill people. That vaping is no good because it also has some chemicals which cause lung injury. So <coughs> smoking should go completely. The 150 minutes remains of exercise, and this is 
like you're doing 30 <coughs> minutes, five days a week, minimum. If you want to do more, you don't have to do some heroic slopes and triathlons. It's just old fashioned walking. Or bad knees, do it, do it elliptical or something like that. There are ways and means to do this, but has to be. I thank my four legged friends who make me walk. Uh, that would be walking too. So there are, th there are ways we can do this. So, <coughs> yes, nutritional policies, that's where the community can help. Yes, we banned soft drinks in schools, haven't we? Yes, I don't think the limits in schools have vending machines and soft drinks anymore. That's, uh, that's a great move. So these are things which we can help. Make the price so high that they can't smoke. <laughs> that's, that's what to do. I remember when we came here, I came here 20, 21 years ago, there was a little, little smoking outside the doors, but all the nurses would be smoking. I don't know, doctors probably smoke, but clandestine. <laughs> but now, if you want to smoke, you've got to come to the road to smoke. Make it harder for people to smoke. On the policy. So those are things that will help. And of course, community events, clinical events, you know, things like that, you know, all of these can be done. And that's how we lift in this up as a community. <coughs> when you look at food, there's a confusing array of diet. Everyone says, no, it's the Atkins. No, it's this, no, it's that. We have riddled down cardiology. We have really shipped down to the Mediterranean diet. You know, it, I mean, that is accepted by the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology. And basically, if you look at this, these are the daily, these are the weekly, those are best avoided. And if you take it, take it as a minimum. So, what do you do daily? You can take a lot of olive oil. Now again, these are all kind of hard to change events. I mean, all these kind of things, so use and things like that. But four servings of olive oil, even a day, is okay. The COVID got us to become a little baking. <coughs> so I use a lot of olive oil. In the bread. There's no fat in the bread, I think. It's all olive oil. So that's another way you can use olive oil. You make your focaccia and things like that. Yes, you can take a good, now, to make patients understand, you can't say, okay, here's a hot, healthy diet, and go and eat. <laughs> It'll all be kilocalories, and he doesn't understand anything, what you're talking about. It has to be in portion sizes. So they said, okay, let's make it like, everyone knows what a tennis ball is. There's no soccer ball here, remember, it's all tennis balls. <laughs> <laughs> so, fruits per day. Three tennis ball size, nuts per week, you know, at least more than three. And a handful of almonds actually is a good thing. But so are walnuts and pecans and things like that. Legumes, fish. Now fish, they use a, a pack of cards and say, okay, that's your serving point. It's a deck of cards. And everyone understands that. Rather than saying, you know, so many kilocalories in one portion. <coughs> so what's a portion? It depends where you are, New York or Texas. <laughs> So that's how they're going to do it. Best avoided, colas. You can use a pan of butter, yeah, but try and use olive oil. So these are guidelines available in every, it's available over the net. Look for a heart healthy. American Heart Association will <coughs> even tell you how to order in a Korean restaurant. It's available. So it's, you know, you can tailor make it. A lot of people eat out. But it'll tell you how to order. Okay. What does all this do? Everything you do, statins, aspirin, diet, cholesterol pills, everything, will reduce the risk of a heart attack 20, 30%. So that's the benefit of following that. Now, <clears throat> risk calculators are again available on the net on your phone. You put all the details, all you need is your cholesterol and whether you smoke or blood pressure, and it'll tell you. This is your risk, less than 7.5, 7.5 to 20. If you're diabetic, you're automatically 20, whatever. So all 
all diabetics, those who have a heart attack, are 20% risk. If you're at high risk, what do you do? <coughs> all, the, all of the above, you know? Exercise, smoking cessation, blood pressures, bariatric surgery, if you run out of option, <coughs> it is a good choice. If your BMI is greater than 35, and don't forget foot care, and other ancillary diseases like fatty liver and things like that. Like I give, I'm giving you an example of how a diabetic patient comes to your office, what our approach is. Number one, what is his blood pressure? Or her blood pressure? Is it less than 160, 100? Or more than 160, 100? If it's less, this is a first time patient coming in. And he said, she's brought you reams and reams of paper. She takes blood pressure every two hours. She gets up at night. She says, please stop. That's what I'm trying to get up. <laughs> she says, stop. Take a good look at this. If it's more than that, you may have to start two pills, two, two agents. What do you start in diabetes? Is there any albumin in the urine? You must get an ACE or an ARB. Common drugs are lisinopril for an ACE or losartan for an ARB. Why? Because it reduces the amount of protein lost in the urine. Diabetics, you keep checking for albumin. So those are the drugs of choice for a diabetic. Then you add calcium blockers and things like that. Now, in the Afro-American community, they don't tolerate ASMR very well. What do you start? A calcium blocker. Because they respond best to a calcium blocker. So the difference is how you look at it. When it's above 160, 100, yes, again, the same thing. You have two drugs. You have a diuretic, always advise them a heart-healthy diet. So, again, as we discussed, <coughs> rehab should be used, targets. Now, what we do as a community, use ancillary help. We see a lot of nurses becoming nurse practitioners. Use them to get into your, your office or to go out to the community and help them to, to, to make this achievable. Because they understand both sides of it. They've been nurses and they understand the patient sometimes even better and use their services. Also, device protocols for treatment. Uh, we have taught in protocols, but also think outside the protocol. There are often patients who need that too. And of course, tobacco cessation, rehab. This is a kind of a synopsis of what we do. Blood pressure control in the aftermarket you have to be aggressive in treating them. Anyone with this age group who has had a cardiac event, there are people, there are family, families of people who die early. You ask them a history. They say, my daddy died at 41, and his father also <coughs> died at 50. I'm here you know, to make sure that I don't die. Why? Because he has a gene which produces that, lipoprotein A familial hyperlipidemia. That's probably what's killing them. You can treat them, even the statins, aggressively, but they may, may need something more. We'll go to that. Anyone who has had a heart attack or stroke, again, high risk, be aggressive. Get that LDL cholesterol down to 70 and below. <clears throat> now, all the cramping is not side effects of statins. <clears throat> statins cause muscle tenderness. I mean, your muscles out of 10 people, two will not tolerate statins. And we have options for that too. So, this thing you can't change. And you can't change your genes, your gender, becoming lipoprotein A. That's what you can change. Diet, exercise, you know, response, stress, blood pressure, inflammation. Inflammation has taken a front seat now because we know the plaque is not just plaque coming there. There's inflammation around the plaque, which makes it trouble. So, primary prevention and secondary prevention, the chasm, and we need to bridge that. So, what do we have?
this is something we are doing aggressively now. We are screening for lipoprotein A. We have standard lipoprotein profile is just yeah, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, triglycerides, and triglycerides are bad diagnosis. And then that's it. Now we have lipoprotein A because we have seen people with 70 bad cholesterol having another heart attack. Now, you say, how? You know, you've done all the right stuff. You're finding them that they have high lipoprotein A. And that's where we have to channel our you know, treatment to. So we do clinical research. I'm a clinical investigator for medications. We are investigating the inflammatory response of lipoprotein A using medication. As I said, Better predictor now when you also ask for a lipoprotein. So when you are in a doctor's office or you work there, you also you would see a doctor now just asking them to do a lipoprotein A. <coughs> a patient can come to a chest pain clinic or an ER. You don't have a chest pain clinic, we have a cardiology clinic, but if you have chest pain, you go to the ER. They have developed protocols of how to triage them know efficiently and assess their risk to say okay this has this man has a high risk he has a high CME score we have scores which we keep and then we keep the patient investigate or you send them home now if you have resources now this is not the Mayo Clinic you know I don't have 10 PAs and you know four this thing I have one you know nurse but in people with resources I have friends in the Oshman Clinic in Louisiana Chest pain comes, there's a guy, there's a little intern or a resident who comes, and the echo machine comes. He does a stress echo there. The stress echo is normal, he goes home. It's abnormal, he goes to the cat lab. And boom, the third day he goes home. We don't have that kind of luxury here. But we do have stress machines. We keep him overnight, do a stress test in the morning. If it shows you know something, you know, high risk, we transfer it and we get a cat. So there are protocols in place. As I said, these are all the screening stuff we do now if a person has high risk. Now, when you have high risk, as I said, you lower that LDL by 50%, which approximately means 70, your bad cholesterol. What if it's still high? Then you add a drug called Zetia. Then if that doesn't work, we have an injection we give monthly called Repatha. It is an immune system, you know, it works through the immune by antibodies. The results are dramatic. The only problem is your insurance company doesn't allow me to write it <laughs> freely. And I wish, now it has become easier. To be, I have a lot of patients now on Repatha who do not tolerate statins, who are not controlled in statin, once in one injection a month. Yes, it does. So, statins are not the safest of all pills. You have to be careful when you prescribe, especially drugs like Simvastatin. Why do cardiologists prefer Lipitor, which is atrovastatin and Crestor? Because their compatibility with other drugs. Much easier. The other drugs like Zocor, you can't give medications like you can't even give grapefruit with that. You know, you gotta take grapefruit in the morning and maybe simple sat in the evening. You can't take it together. You can't take commonly used blood pressure pills. You do not prescribe higher doses, you know. Crestor also has something. If you have an Asian patient, and by Asian I mean you know Oriental, you give them high dose crestor, it's severely reaction. They get rid So you give not more than five milligrams of cholesterol. So these are things, in special population, we use, we use the knowledge we have to tailor make it for them. So that's why we use Lipitor and Cholesterol more commonly. Uh, this is the same thing what we're talking. Now, we're stuck, and that's why the million, you know, thing here. Right up to here, we had come good, but we are smoldering around. Why are they not improving? because we're not targeting it well. So, 
the disparities. Afro American is high. <clears throat> so look at the numbers, 400,000. You know, so you have to target them. To that credit, Native Americans have done much better. This was this number was somewhere near high, but they brought it down with just by targeting the population. We know the diabetes is very high. You start early, get the blood pressure down, get them to do their stress tests and things like that. And that number has dropped. It's very heartening. So that's how we target these studies. There are studies too which are still ongoing. We have new drugs. <coughs> blood thinners which start acting right away. Previously we had the old rat poison. Look at it. Warfarin. Wisconsin alumni research. That's how the WAR. Somewhere in, the, in somewhere in the farms of Wisconsin. They found out that we could use look at it. We used it for 50 odd years. And the PTI must go here, there. <coughs> Now we have the Ralto eloquence. Again, a problem of prescribing, but it's much less now. It's so much more convenient. And you can eat all the greens you want. Not with coumadin. On the cap table, we have Relenta, which acts in 10 minutes. So you have an acute MI, and you come without any medicine, <coughs> not aspirin, not nothing. You give Relenta a loading dose of 180. That starts acting on the table while you're working. So we use that. So there are new drugs to be used to advantage. Okay, what can we offer now? It's 2022. And yes, we have the old stress test exercise and nuclear, but you will see a lot more innovation coming through. And uh, yes, in fact, I spoke to Rotary Club that they have a big sponsor of this thing for us. But you will see images now. Previously, <coughs> a stress test which we do, you know, it's like sectioning the heart. You section a hollow organ, you get a donut. And you see a full donut, means you're lighting up well, <coughs> good supply. I always tell them, you know, keep the donut whole. Just keep it, don't eat it, you know. Keep it whole. That is a good supply. Now, get used to this kind of image. You will get like this blue one says is dead, it's car. We got a picture, it's a composite picture between a stress and a PET scan and what we call as CT. You're going to see the blood vessel on that. Previously you had to do an angiogram for that, invasive. Here you're using 100 cc of diacrone intravenous. This will come. And it'll tell you which one we can revascularize. So this part is good to revascularize. No point in revascularizing this one. That's the kind of picture you're going to get. So it's all is there. It's just to be implemented. You get pictures like this. So these are patients like you see something in the echo. Blurry. So we do a T E. We put a probe like an endoscopy with a probe. Here, cardiac MRI, you just put it into a chamber and look at the clarity of the pictures. You see this big mass is there moving in and out, you know. That's the clarity of picture you get. I mean, the patient will understand when you see that kind of picture. This is already there. Again, not widespread. As I said, the Rotary Club might give us a cardiac MRI. Who knows? <laughs> look at this. Handheld echo. Come to that. You know, it's, it's like you know a small tablet like this, you know, or even a cell phone. Like you put it in your cell phone, you put it here, you get your EKG. I have patients already who said, "My Apple Watch says I'm in AFib." <laughs> Just imagine. You know, it's giving you the diagnosis already. I don't have to put a 30 uh, hour quarter. It's on this watch. It's there. So you, this is already there, it's already in the market. This one, this is a new one, called Cosmos. It comes with artificial intelligence analysis already built. That 
means you're going to generate a report for me. I just going to see, okay, what you're saying is right. Don't believe all what it says, but you're going to generate that because the data has been fed into this There's so many different, you know, studies that he knows that this is a plausible diagnosis. And then you do this, you get a carotid. You see what he's doing? <laughs> and then you do then your ultrasound, that's your EKG, which you just place this on your chest and you get your curly. This can be done in the ER. It'll save you so many, you know, many kind of dollars by not admitting this patient if everything is turned out okay. And also the doctor, so he says, hey, something was done for me. The biggest complaint that I get from patients who come for their first, he's saying, nobody saw me. I said, no, that's not true. You are the monitor. There are people there inside and watching you. And that, they don't understand that. But when you do something like this, they feel that something has been done. And we have done this for them. So that's what's going to come. Direct attention comes by these kind of tests. They do procedures like Michael Clip. Now this guy's got wide open Michael Regurg. It's all flooded up. His lungs are flooding up. He's, well, 89 years old. And his wife brings him beautifully to the ER every time he gets a flash call from his EMA. What are you going to do? You put him on the table, he might die on the table. You know, the operating table. You go in, snake your wire up here, and put a micro clip. Just clip the valve through the axis in the groin. That's how it's fly by wire. So if your grandkids are playing with the phone and video games, let them do it because that will come handy for them. And they do these kind of things now when they are older. So Okrura devices, we, 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 we actually treat you know, holes in the heart, we call it those days. ASDs, we have these. You put one from here, one from here, clamp shall shut without opening the chest. That's how all this is available. 21 years ago, I met the father of cardiology, Eugene Brownwell. I had some hair though. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I had heard this man's name since the day I was in medical school, 1975. Because he wrote our textbook, Eugene Brownwell. And I had the honor of standing with him, and he gives you your, you know, fellowship of the ACC fellowship. 2001. So this man is still there. He's 93 years old. He came as an immigrant from Austria, you know, running away from the Nazis and came to, you know, first to Boston and then set up his thing for Brigham at Boston. So last month, he was giving us a grand round at the Methodist Hospital. And I went and listened to what he's saying now, at the age of 92, he's saying, yes, you've got, you know, right now you have the definition of diagnosing and treating. He says in 1932, you will be looking for genetic markers. And he's, at the age of 92, telling us, go and learn your genetics now, because they're all there. And what is the evidence? Here's the evidence. <clears throat> now, this is a drug. He says that inflammation causes a lot of problems, so we're using anti-inflammatory drugs. A typical one was methotrexate and colchicine. We use colchicine for gout, common drug. Those are in trial now, because it has a beneficial effect on the, on the inflammatory part of we use this drug as a, as a, it's kind of you know, man. It is a, it was experimental. It showed promising results, but did not have full, you know, the FDA could not approve it completely. But that's the right trend we're going to, using anti-inflammatory drugs. By using genetic markers, now genetic markers mean you take a blood test and see if you're prone for heart disease. It's a screening test, and that's coming. You know, you go to, like you do your CBC and CMP and your lipids, you look for a marker for you, especially in high-risk populations. 
By adding that, you find the large risk of the larger number of people who are at risk. You add it to the present one. So this was just last month when he was talking to us about that. So supposing you have a patient who says his father died at 40 and he's now 30 years old. And what are you going to do? He has a genetic marker saying that, hey, you're prone for heart disease. So how do you start treating? You know? We have a once a year injection now. Not once a month. It's called inclisiran. You give 300, you know, as a single injection, like you give a flu shot. Now, when I say vaccination, everyone. Mm. No, this is a prevention. This is will prevent. So, if you don't treat him, he's going to get his heart attack at 60 over here and probably die from it. You give an injection when he's 30. Look at this how he has prolonged his lifespan at 30 years. Start early. Use that 35 to 64 window of people who are at risk. And that's what they've shown. So this is also, we are doing this trial too. 300 milligram along with their flow shot. And you don't have to worry about statin. Is that one injection? One injection per year, like a flow shot once a year. That's what could come. So all this is in the pipeline, and it's very exciting. We talked about CHIP, clonal hematopoiesis or interstitial potential. All this mumbo jumbo is only saying it's a little marker, and they have found this marker in postmenopausal women now. Like if you're postmenopausal, you can go and see if you have a CHIP, which is positive, then we take, we find out that you're at higher risk. So that's what he's talking about. Artificial intelligence. Now, you take an EKG and I look at it and say, okay, normal. <coughs> or if it, what does the artificial intelligence do? It goes to the electrical component, sees the measurement of the atrium, and it'll tell you that this patient in 20 years will develop a fit. But applying artificial intelligence to a simple EKG. So that's how important it is to utilize this in medicine. As I said, you will use AI in prevention and in treatment. You have to use genetic information, the patient demographics, and then that's how you treat it. So we call it something like the Uberization of healthcare. Ubers come to you. You know, you don't go to them. So the same day, healthcare is going to come to you. Like you pick up the, the internet or phone and say, okay, I need a CAT scan or I need an ultrasound. Normally you call the doctor's office and you get a Star Wars voice. You know, at least you get a message. After you talk to a human being. You know. Now you will get over there and say, okay, this guy, he comes to this point, it will be half an hour away, it will be done the same day. And a lot of people are doing that. service is coming to you, and that's what we're going to do. Now that's new. We did telemedicine, I learned some things to do with telemedicine. You shut the office for three weeks and you're sitting at home, and you don't want to go to the shop, so a little, little benefit there too, but this is going to not take over, but this is a very useful tool. There are people who can't come to the office. You close at 5, he finishes at 5.30. Don't work on Saturday. You know, kids are waiting for something on the TV. No, we talk to him at home, and we have telemedicine available for people. So there are so many things. Why? Because, and let's use that technology. You know, it took seven years to reach one billion users of Facebook. Let's use it for the right reasons. This cell phone of ours. You know, Diagnosis is atrium. The smart watch is only there. So that's how it's changing. Let's go to the basics. Don't forget.
forget the application software and the backup. Oh Always back up your work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any questions? tomatoes in my office. I said, oh, the tomatoes. I said, yes. Only thing you can squeeze it, but it won't splash up in your face. There's some hand sanitizer back here, as well as nail files and some educational materials. So please grab, grab it as you come to leave today. National Bank or not. Kara White, I'm a nurse with Kinder Trust. Just the military with Kinder Trust. I'm Jessica Antry, and I'm business development with their care home health. I'm Ebony White, I um, work at Kinder Hospice. Terry Gordon with Kinder. I'm Rachel Clayman, I'm with Kinder Hospice. I'm Veronica Thomas, I'm with Kinder Hospice. Christina Wood, Marketing for Kindred Hospice. I'm Cheryl Downing with the Alabama Cushata Tribe. Rachel Beeson, Bradbury for Cushata Business Development. Josh Eureka, Financial Advisor with Edward Jones. Holly Kravasik, retired. <laughs> <laughs> Irene Goins, Customer Service Professional at First National Bank. Courtney Wire with Kindred Hospice. Virginia Key, retired. Sheila Cannon with C uh, Cannon CPR Training and Services. And who's working today at Kinder's Office? <laughs> <laughs> they all get we lunch out. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm a her. Okay. I'm, a her. <laughs> I'm Lisa Cruz. I am with Keller Williams. And I'm Madison Bland. I'm with the Fort County Enterprise. Thank you. We'd like to tell um, Alabama Cachata Cap. Uh, thank you again for sponsoring today's lunch, and we can't thank you guys enough for all you do for us. And now we're going to do our door prize. We got several of them. Okay.